Today on the future of everything, the future of epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of factors that determine the presence or absence of disease. At least that's according to the internet. Epidemiologists try to determine who gets a disease and why. Is it their genetics? Is it their environment or some combination? Which factors are the most important for increasing risk? And is there anything we can do to decrease risk? Now, in the last two years or so, uh, we're speaking in 2021, during the COVID-19 pandemic, epidemiology has pretty much been on everybody's mind. First, we wondered what caused the clinical syndrome that we were observing that was unlike things we had seen before. It turned out to be an infectious virus. We wondered what were the risk factors? Initially, it appeared that men with hypertension or diabetes and obesity were at increased risk. But right there, that's tricky because diabetes is associated with obesity. So the question immediately comes up, is it the diabetes that's the risk factor or the obesity? Which one is really driving the risk? This is the kind of thing epidemiologists care about. It's critical because if it's the diabetes that's causing the problem, you might wanna make extra sure that you're treating diabetes very aggressively which of course is probably a good idea anyway. But if it's the obesity, then you might wanna recommend that people work hard to lose weight. Again, we might wanna do that, but there's a big difference in the interventions you might take based on your understanding of the true risk factors. And then of course, for COVID, we wondered about the vaccine epidemiology, who did it work for, when did it work, et cetera. So all of these questions require epidemiologists to untangle these difficult questions and give the best answers supported by the evidence and logic. Very often the answers are not absolute but are partial or uncertain. One of the challenges then to epidemiologists all the time and especially in the last two years has been providing clear explanations of their findings that are appropriately qualified with all the ifs, ands, and buts. Now let's admit it, people don't like that. Most people just want an answer and not an explanation for all the reasons why a question is difficult or the answer is not black and white, but sometimes that's all we can provide. So a better understanding of epidemiology would be useful for everyone. Next time there is a talking head on TV telling us about our favorite disease or our unfavorite disease, it would help us to understand their message if we understand a bit more about how they do their work. Well, Professor Leanne Carina is a professor of medicine and epidemiology and population health at Stanford University. Leanne, one of the key decisions an epidemiologist makes is how they design their studies. What does study design, and I'm using scare quotes, what does study design mean and how can it alter the conclusions uh, when you're looking at a, a, a new question? Yeah, great question, um, because study design relates directly to how much confidence we might have in the results that have come out. So um, I'm going to stop, start at the very top of the evidentiary ladder. Great. Um, and, and let's dive right into the COVID vaccine trials. Okay, so this is a set of work that we've all benefited from enormously. And the reason why public health practitioners and CDC and Dr. Fauci and your doctors, everybody's doctors, are so confident that the vaccine works is because there was a randomized control trial for each of them, right? Mm -hmm. And we've seen this and we've been, we've been all been waiting in real time for them to conduct these studies, for them to finish these studies, right? And we're, we're just waiting for the kids' studies now to be finalized. And, and here's what's awesome about randomized controlled trials. What they do is divorce who gets the vaccine from who doesn't from any characteristics that the study participants might have. So if we back it up a little bit and think about other kinds of things, I'm interested in studying, many epidemiologists are studying like health behaviors. Exercise say, okay, if we just compare people who exercise to people who don't exercise, Automatically, you're thinking, wait a second, those exercisers, their diet might be different, all kinds of their socioeconomic status might be different, all kinds of things might be different about them that relate to the outcome. In these randomized controlled trials, the very top of our kind of evidentiary ladder, again, in epidemiology, you take a group of people, randomize them, they don't choose which group they're in. Their doctors don't choose what group they're in. The investigator doesn't choose. They're randomized into two groups. 
The only thing really that differs between them is whether or not they got the active vaccine in the COVID example or a placebo. And that so, would be super hard to do for exercise where you would take a, a 50,000 people and tell half of them to exercise and the other half not to. That I just don't see that happening anytime soon. It's been very challenging. People have tried, epidemiologists have tried. Um, behavior modification in general is wildly difficult as, as each of us knows at a personal level, yes. <laughs> right? Each New Year's rolls around and you know the weights that I have in the corner still haven't gotten touched, okay. So, right, so when we're thinking about um, medical interventions in particular, vaccines, um, statins, right? Um, some the cholesterol like, medications. Right, medications that themselves could have side effects, many of them, right? Um, or even surgical interventions. Those things need to be trialed, right? So that we're, so that we're giving people the best sort of evidence-based medicine possible. So we just kind of, and I didn't outline it clearly, but we've got the COVID vaccine trials, randomized control trials, very strong causal inference. And what that means is, can we say that the vaccines work? Yes, because there were very strong randomized controlled trials that proved it. In other situations, observational designs, lots of different types, those are a lot more challenging. So that's actually the space where my work dwells. And you don't get that power of randomization. So you're always a little bit worried. Right about confounding, right? Maybe the exercisers are having a better diet. Um, you're worried about bias, right? The people that you've included in your studies may not be representative of individuals with that exposure, things like that. Right, so you said a word that I wanna highlight. You said causal. And um, my understanding is that the randomized controlled trials, one of their bis big, uh, big benefits is that when the group that got the vaccine had a lower rate of COVID, you could say the vaccine caused that because there was no other difference in the two groups. Um, now, uh, there, then there's the question, as, as I understand it, and I wanted, I wanted to ask you about this, um, the, the only uh, problem, potential problem, is that the people who agreed to be in the trial um, constitute a type of person who wants to, you know, participate in medical research. So as a doctor, the one thing that I have to worry about is whether or not their willingness to be in the trial conferred some feature on them that um, other people might not have. Um, yeah. and, and, and I know that more generally, and as you know, I'm a physician, we yeah. always have to worry about whether the, the, the group that was in the trial applies to the patient who's sitting in front of me. Now, I think for the vaccines, we're thinking it's yeah. very hard to imagine any feature of a human that would make a causal virus not a, a causal vaccine uh, causing resistance to the to the infection not work. But that 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 but that is something that at least formally you have to address. Is that a fair thing to say? That's a fair thing to say. Um, and um, yeah, so this, this feature that you're describing is um, something that we call external validity or generalizability in epidemiology, right? And, um, and we could think of it actually with regard to any study design. Is it the case that the study population that you've included, the people in your study, how good a job do they do at standing in for the population that you want to apply right, it to. Right, exactly. Thank you. Right. That's so a much that's, nicer way of, of saying what I was trying to say. Well, <laughs> I'm getting ready for my class in the fall. <laughs> All good. It, it just, you know, rolls out. So, so that so that's a that's a that's a really important question. Um you also kind of hit the nail on the head. So how confident we might feel that our results generalize to the population that we want to be speaking to will depend, A, on how much they look like them. Do they capture quite a wide age range, uh, quite a uh, you know, different gender range, race, ethnicity? Did, did, did the trial do a good job of that? When it has, ooh, that's gonna kind of boost our confidence right. in this, especially sometimes when the trials are large enough, the investigators will look at that directly. They'll split the um, results up by, you know, is it the case that the vaccine works differently in males versus females, right? Did it work differently in old people versus young people? And, and then can kind of speak to get that 
specific question directly. Right. With a vaccine, as you say, you know, it would be hard to come up with a biological story for way for why it might operate differently. Now, the exception being, of course, um, you know, what we have seen is that people who are immunocompromised, right, or have multiple quite serious health conditions, they may not have the robust sort of antibody production that most of us have happily experienced. Um, and that's something that a, a physician would be tracking with those right. patients and paying right. close attention to. Um, I, so it is true that we want to be careful always when extrapolating results. Here's a beautiful example. Do you want an, a good example? Of course. Yeah. Okay. So you may recall um, uh, the HRT trials. Hormone. Okay. The hormone replacement therapy, right? Yes. And based on the observational data, it looked like hormone replacement therapy might be um, a, a really powerful uh, protective agent against cardiovascular disease, right? Okay. So hormone replacement therapy. Uh, originally was designed, right, to help address um, troublesome symptoms of menopause, right? So many women will experience really debilitating symptoms and hormone replacement therapy was a way to address those. And then some observational data started suggesting quite strongly that, hey, these women seem to be getting a boost a protection against cardiovascular disease. And so it began to be more widely prescribed as a preventive agent before the trial data came out. So oh, that trial was fascinating for a lot of reasons. It was big, really well done. Um, and what you may recall is that it did not find a protective effect against cardiovascular disease, uh, increased risk of breast cancer, which they had anticipated, um, some protection against colon cancer. Now, here's the tricky thing, Russ. The women that they included in the study, right, many of them were postmenopausal. There weren't that many women entering menopause in the study. So that gets back to your generalization question, uh, right? How applicable are those results to the woman who comes into your clinic experiencing menopausal symptoms? Maybe she's starting perimenopause. Would there be a protective effect? Um, you know, the recommendation is no. The trial data uh -huh, are uh -huh. clear, but there's always been a little bit of a question mark because of exactly what you described, study population problem. So I would say, um, back to the COVID vaccine trials, strong trials, yes. no concerns about external validity or generalizability there. Yes. yes, this is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, I'm speaking with Dr. Leanne Karina, and we're talking about epidemiology. And I wanted to get to what you were saying is, is your interest, which are these ob observational studies, which are, a, a, in the language you've been using, Kind of a notch or two below the on the ladder of um, of, of gold standard evidence, where the randomized control is at the top, and yet for many questions that I think you're interested in, that's the main option. And right. so um, within that, what are the things you can do to try to ensure that your results are as robust and as generalizable as possible? Given that you know, and you you already described that you're worried about these other variables that could be correlations that are not actually causing the, the diseases that you're studying. So it's, it's a, especially in light of the fact that now with electronic uh, media, we have medical records, we have claims data from insurance companies that some of them even make that, certainly Medicare makes that available for research. So there's a great opportunity. And yet you're, I'm sure you're worried about drawing the wrong, wrong conclusion. So how do you, how do you approach it? Right. Um, so that's a great question. So um, depending on the data that you're working with um, or whether you're collecting your own, um, you have more or less power to control. This is what we say, we control for a bunch of confounders, mm -hmm. right? So for example, in any observational study that you were doing of any outcome you would imagine, you would always include age, gender, um, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status to the extent that you have it, because these are sociodemographic factors that are powerfully related to just about any outcome you could imagine, often in different ways. Um, so, so one thing that epidemiologists do is 
uh, try to collect data on and then include those data about all these various possible confounders to try to adjust those effects away. Yep. Right. And so if you do a good job of that, you'll have kind of a lot more confidence that the um, particular exposure is what we would call that you're interested in studying. Um, you, you have more confidence in that kind of result if you've adjusted for the other factors. Now, you know, when you're just working with um, medical record data, you're a little bit stymied. Right, so you may or may not have good resolution on people's health behaviors. You're not going to have good resolution really on their socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. right? Maybe educational attainment. Um, so it it is it's it's it, it's a little bit tricky. So the so we work with um, military data, and we do have medical record data, but we have lots of other different data types as well that. Um, help us adjust for and, and study things of interest like physical fitness level. Yep. So that's an example where the military data are fantastic. Physical fitness is directly related to their job and their job possibilities. Um, that's something that's quite hard to study at a large scale in other populations because when do we collect it, right? right. When you go to the doctor, I mean, I think my doctor asks me, do I exercise? Right. I might. <laughs> exaggerate a tiny bit <laughs> we all would right, right. Well, okay i don't know maybe i just died no 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 no. Right. i can assure you from both yeah. ends of the so so but let me ask you about because yeah. you were talking about you you always there's certain things you always kind of try to control for yeah. by finding matched patients in your observational study for things like um uh, sex and socioeconomic status. Yep. But for a particular question that you're asking, my guess is you also have to sit there and brainstorm other things that might not be the normal, the usual suspects like yep. sex and, and uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, status, but you still have to worry about them because they could be issues. And so right. that sounds like that's where the good epidemiologists might be separated from the ones who are not careful, because it sounds like you have to have a kind of profound uh, almost philosophical thinking about the disease that you're studying and the other variables that might impact it. Is, is that true? That, that That's true. And in fact, I mean, when you sort of alluded at the beginning to the future of epidemiology, so there are kind of a growing field um, around causal inference. And there are people who um, create what they call these directed acyclic graphs to try to capture the whole web of causality that might be out there, as well as things that would be possible confounders, and, and then build models that kind of incorporate exactly that type of information. So it also say, um, when we're thinking about these confounders, right, there's your standard set that I described, the rest will often be driven, of course, by the outcome that you're studying. So mm -hmm. if heart disease is your outcome of interest, Right. Well, okay. You're going to have to have blood pressure, right? Cholesterol levels, family history, the things that might go into the Framingham risk score. Right. You really want to be controlling for whether or not, you know, they may or may not be related to your exposure of interest. But if they're strong drivers of the outcome, it is very typical to include right. those factors. Those are going to vary if you're studying breast cancer, right? That will be a different suite of control factors. So the key for epidemiologists, so some epidemiologists specialize in a particular substantive area like cardiovascular disease. Some epidemiologists like me are more generalist. So I specialize in a particular population, military population. Right. So then it's essential for us that on every single paper, I have subject matter experts for that outcome of interest, right? When we were studying heat injury. Well, that's a different suite of risk factors than musculoskeletal studies that we've done, right? Or studies focused on post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, these tend to be quite large collaborative efforts to be sure we protect the results as far as possible against confounding. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, more with Professor Leanne Karina about epidemiology and some of its applications next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Leanne Karina about epidemiology. And I wanted to get into, you mentioned in our previous segment that you focus on the epidemiology of diseases and conditions in the military, which is a, a great topic. So I wanted to ask how you got involved and what, what's some of the things you're looking at? Yeah. Um, 
So originally I got involved because a PhD student showed up at the University of Chicago, where I was at the time, and I became his advisor and he was an active duty uh, active duty officer in the U.S. Army, and, and that was how my involvement um, started. So um, collaboratively, um, largely through the efforts of this student, um, Alan Nelson, who um, is now at Universe, uh, Uniform Services University. So um, the military developed a, a large data set, lots of different types of data, to allow us to study disability, actually. They were worried about rising levels of um, non-trauma-related disability among the active duty soldiers. And their question was, if somebody shows up at the doctor, how good a job could you do at predicting their likelihood of being medically separated in a year's time? So we built some disability prediction models, um, which actually got folded into um, the Army's electronic medical record system. Huh. Yeah, wow. the MRAT was their first kind of prediction tool that they incorporated um, and then went on to do a, a bunch of other studies. So one um, really important thing that the military wanted to know, in particular the Army, was whether they should be screening universally for sickle cell traits. So very quickly, so when people have two copies, right, of the sickle cell disease gene, they have sickle cell disease and it's quite debilitating, right? This is a very painful and um, difficult condition for the people who have it. So that people who are homozygous for sickle cell, uh, for the sickle cell disease gene would not be eligible for service in the military, would preclude that. However, people of one copy of the sickle cell disease gene who are heterozygous have what's called sickle cell trait generally a benign condition, right? Very few kind of um, problematic outcomes that have been noted, except for concerns that grew around exertion-related fatalities. And there was concern that people with sickle cell trait are at increased risk of exertion-related fatalities. I think many people will have seen um, stories about football players who have died and possibly also about service members who have died and, mm -hmm. and the circumstances tend to be um, quite similar when these happen. So for football players, it tends to be in um, preseason kind of um, training events where, they've, where they're deconditioned and they're trying to come back. And it's often August <laughs> and 90 degrees. Absolutely, yes, exactly right. So for service members, it's almost always when they're trying to pass their physical fitness exam which is interesting too, right. right? It's never when they're deployed and things like that. So there's kind of these kind of extreme physical efforts and concerns about people with sickle cell trait being at increased risk of these exertion related fatalities. So the various branches of the military have dealt with this differently. Um, some screen universally, some will um, uh, make it clear which soldiers have sickle cell trait with an armband or a different color belt. This is, often controversial among the service members who may not want, want to be singled out, out. Yeah. want to be marked kind of as it were. Um, so the army a couple of decades ago had reported on an increased risk and then, and then did the following. So they took a very occupational epidemiology approach. They decided they were going to enforce um, hydration and um, heat related precautions for all soldiers. Right, and they did that. And, and here's something that's a little bit unfortunate, Russ. There was an experiment. It's only ever been published in abstract form. Um, so it, uh, it, it showed in the abstract that these precautions seem to eliminate any effect of sickle cell trait on exertion related fatalities. Now, did it meet all the standards of the beautiful randomized control trials that we were describing before? No, but powerful evidence still. Um, so what we did, this is taking me a long time to get to what we did. What we did was to use the army data and the fact that large numbers of soldiers had been screened for sickle cell traits. So this would often happen before uh, large deployments right, that the whole whole units would be screened. So kind of independent of particular health events going on, commanders were not aware necessarily of the sickle cell trait status, clinicians not necessarily aware, there's no marking that goes on in the army. And so we use that data to test whether individuals with sickle cell trait 
were more likely to die than people without um, and found no difference. Virtually identical mortality rates comparing people with to those without wow. sickle cell traits. So that was really reassuring. Yes. Um, so we've gone on to kind of in that thread and have looked at um, heat injury and kidney disease and uh, exertional rhabdomyolysis. We have a new paper coming out on uh, venous thromboembolism. So lots all of different- All the setting of sickle cell or even and more generally? Correct. So all of these have focused on sickle cell. Okay. Right, and, and, and for various reasons, right? So these exertion related fatalities, obviously we we're thinking, well, heat injury and or exertional rhabdo could kind of be on the pathway. And we see some modest effects for those, um, but similar in magnitude to uh, having high BMI or smoking, right? So kind of um, uh, quite similar to modifiable risk factors. Right. Right. Um, and right, so, that, so that's been sort of one large thread um, of research that we've done with the military. And, and I know uh, we have about two minutes left, but I do want to touch upon because you have a fascinating series of papers about nutrition and stress and women's health and too much to really go into all of it. So maybe I'll give you um, guests choice. Tell us some of the interesting things in, uh, uh, among those other studies, um, fitness, tobacco, sleep. I just, I saw a great list. Um, yeah. They're all of great interest, not only to the military, but to everybody. So uh, what, what have you learned about that has been useful? to the military? Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing that we found um, have been these really robust associations between fitness and improved health outcomes across the board, across the types of outcomes that we've studied. And as I had alluded to before, the military population is a great population to work with from a data perspective because they have a lot of information about the soldier's physical fitness status. They yeah. have to do these regular physical fitness tests, so it's quite detailed. And, um, and what we find is in terms of kind of protecting against future injury, high fitness levels, even in this uniformly active, quite fit group, we still see strong protective effects, particularly for female soldiers. Huh. Um, so that was that was really interesting. So that was one. Um, Does that, that yeah. last for a couple of years or for a lifetime? What is the uh, the uh, horizon oh. that you have when you talk about the long the long term benefits of the fitness? Great question. So for the studies that we've been doing, um, this has been really within the span of four or five years. Okay. Right. So quite quite compressed. Um, so we can't kind of speak what we would love to do, Ross. Do we have not? accomplished yet is to link the active duty data to the veteran data, right? And if we could do that, then have kind of much longer time horizons, even after individuals have left service, uh, I think that would be uh, incredible. These are two distinct um, and Right. large organizations. So we have not been able to, to accomplish that yet, but I would love to. And the security and privacy issues. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of our two minutes, but I was great. I was very happy to get that taste of, of the work you've done on fitness. Uh, thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.